Hello and welcome back to the Indian Wisdom Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Rush Balkran. More importantly, you, you just might be seeking inspired insight, which you can apply to everyday life, and maybe you might like a tale or two. Today's topic is this teeny tiny thing called the Great Goddess, <laughs> the Holy Mother. Uh, ancient India uh, had a vibrant, great goddess tradition. I don't mean just the presence of goddesses, small g goddesses, such as consort goddesses or goddesses uh, pertaining to natural phenomenon, uh, goddesses of the dawn, for example, since Vedic times. Right? We see this in various uh, iterations of Indo-European myth. But ancient India is home to a tradition that says above and beyond all of the the, the, sm- the gods and the goddesses, there is a great divine principle, the supreme, the ontological, cosmic supreme. It's not a he. It's not an it. It's a she. Now, what could this mean? What are the reverberations within one's consciousness or spiritual practice to be ideating upon and pursuing a divine substratum gendered as she. What could this possibly mean? Well, there are no shortage, there's no shortage of iterations of articulations of the divine, this great feminine form uh, through Sanskrit narrative traditions. My PhD work actually was on this first Sanskritic iteration of the great goddess called the Devi Mahatmya. Mm, I used to translate that as the greatness of the goddess, but Mahatmya is more, yes, it's sort of greatness, but it's it's glories, right? It's sort of um, the, the, the celebration of the feats, glorification. So the glories of the goddess, or perhaps the goddess's glory, okay? The glory of the goddess. This is the text upon which I did my PhD dissertation. I did a literary uh, read of this text and showed that there is a sophisticated structure of the text um, that interweaves two different sets of values, worldly and otherworldly. The text has this intriguing frame narrative of a deposed king who wanders into the forest bereft of power, who there encounters a merchant uh, bereft of merchandise. <laughs> Uh, a sort of uh, you know an impoverished uh, commercial mercantile type uh, because he had his wealth stolen by his family and the king had his power stolen by his ministers and evil princes from adjoining lands and th- these these uh, gentlemen represent really existential crises. What is a king without a kingdom? Yes. What is a bird without feathers? Yes. What is a lake without water? And so they're deposed, they're disoriented, they're disenfranchised, and they wander the woods, the garnam varnam, the deep, dark woods, home of both the animal and the supernatural. The, 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 the forest of ancient India, to my mind, very much represents the unconscious. The city represents the conscious, structured, waking, uh, practical life, and the woods and the forests. Uh, the Aranya, as opposed to the Grama. Uh, I think I have that right. Yes, may mix that up. No, it's Aranya, correct. This is the locus <laughs> of the beastly and the magical alike. This is where Rama encounters the Vanaras, the monkey people, for example. Uh, a great many adventures are to be had in the forest. So this king, too, deposed, encounters a sage who tells him the tales of the greatness of the goddess. So there are three acts of the goddess. It's a tripartite text. But that frame narrative is really the Rosetta Stone to interpreting the power of the the Divine Mother. Because in the end, these two seekers uh, collectively worship. They worship the the goddess through, uh, through the idiom of bhakti or devotionalism. 
this uh, religious idiom is very much alive today, and you can see it operating in temples or in home rituals, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, at home shrines. And um, what this entails is precisely what these gentlemen did at the end of their hearing of the glories of the goddess. They erected a murti, an embodiment of a deity. People tend to sometimes think of these as statues, but a statue, um, right? The various words, right? Icon. They don't connote the difference between something consecrated versus not consecrated. A murti or an embodiment is a representation of the divine uh, into which the divine presence has been invited uh, to, to, to dwell. This is a concept that we see in various world traditions where objects are sacredly empowered in a sense. And this is really by which um, the veneration thereof is not idolatry in the sort of pejorative Judeo-Christian sense. Not at all. It is actually connecting with the divine uh, through uh, the presence therein. Right? So, so they establish a murti, they consecrate the, the presence of the goddess, and they worship it, as mentioned, through the idiom of bhakti. They offer fruits and flowers and flame and incense, and they chant hymns, and, and they, 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 they chant glorious Sanskrit praise. There are actually four hymns to be found in the Devi Madhya. And um, at some point, after three long years of worship by this riverbank, the Divine Mother appears to them and says, well, okay, you know, hum, I'm a giver of boons. What is it you wish for? And the merchant says, look, uh, in the words of Queen, I want to break free. <laughs> I want that knowledge, which takes me beyond minus and minus. Please, I've had enough. The past too, so be it. And so the merchant was blessed with moksha, with emancipation from samsara, the cycle of birth and death and rebirth. This emancipation is typically accompanied by awareness, full, complete knowledge, <laughs> unsullied seeing power, to see all there is to see, to be fully conscious, renders one beyond the field of samsara. And this is what the merchant gets as a, as a wish. This is a nod to Upanishadic Hinduism, which very much is geared towards waking up, opting out of the matrix. Now the king, on the other hand, he's like, you know what, holy mother, I'd like my kingdom back. Does she chastise him? No. She happily blesses him thus. In three days' time, O noble king, engage your foe, and by my blessing, you will reign supreme and conquer them and regain your throne. And then, that throne you'll have for the rest of your life, and then when you finish this life, clearly you have an astromotion, so you'll be coming back. I will actually exalt you to be the next Manu, lord of the next age, sovereignty. You're currently under the reign of the Manu, the primordial person, uh, Vaivasvata. But Savan is the next Manu. And you will be he, incarnate, by my grace, by my blessing. So be it. The king was not only not reprimanded or chastised for his attachment uh, to the world or for his worldly inclination, he was rewarded for it. And this is important and profound. Uh, the ways of the Holy Mother are both spiritual and material in the sense that she is a bhukti mukti pradayani. She's the giver of enjoyment and she's the giver of liberation. And we see this interplay between the two very much at the forefront of Shaktism. Shaktism essentially has to do with um, the worship of Holy Mother, of the Great Goddess, and also in Tantric traditions, and there's a huge overlap between the two. Now, why is it called Shaktism? Because the Goddess 
is tantamount to, is equivalent to shakti, power, energy, force. She is both, uh, she is mythologized, uh, she, she represents both the forces we feel on the physical level. So she's often depicted as wielding colossal martial prowess. But above and beyond the physical, she is the spiritual force as well. The force which is used by the Jedi. <laughs> she is both material and physical, right? She is ability, energy, power in its broadest sense. The great goddess in Indic traditions is a personification of power itself. And as much power as various heroes and demons may possess, who can possess more power than power itself? And so, in all of her martial encounters, she is a victorious. In every village, in every temple, in every home, in every tradition across the Indic world and now the Indic diaspora, which invokes the great goddess. They invoke her as she who was victorious. Indeed, Jaya Jaya is a common appeal, is a common celebration, a mode of honoring her. Jaya Jaya, victory to you. Because she's ever victorious. She represents victory itself. Because who can possess more power than power itself? She's ever victorious. This is an inalienable aspect of her archetypal portfolio of who and what she is, what she represents. Isn't it fascinating that even in a patriarchal tradition, that we have this vibrant impulse to mythologize, to personify, to engage power as a she, not a he. What's the difference between the he and the she with respect to the principle of power? Right. In a certain sense, we could think of he's as individuals wielding power. We could think of this she as the principle of power itself. The former might be thought of as particles, the latter perhaps a wave. It seems to my mind that there are two fundamentally different modes of relating to and engaging power. Okay, we have this very sort of timely notion that power needs to be critiqued and adjusted and, and all that jazz, and that's very, very important. There's no question about that. But what people mean is that power that looks like a top-down hierarchy where those atop the pyramid scheme um, have gained their power by usurping the power of others. Power over. This is what we mean by addressing systems of power. This is not the only um, MO. There is a very different type of leadership where rather than transactional tit-for-tat hierarchical power, um, what is entailed is inspirational or transformational leadership, where one inspires others through a shared set of values, through a vision of the way the world could be. And one leaves space for those individuals to tap into their own abilities and manifest them towards the common goal. So while power has often historically been used to disempower others, ultimately, rightfully, power's purpose is empowerment. This is the ultimate purpose of power, to empower others. Particularly, they who have had their power stolen by less noble actors. So one way we could think about 
the colossal transformation afoot across the globe. Indeed, the multi-century project of forging a global consciousness. Homo sapiens have never had to do this before. It's a very difficult work. A potent frame through which to view this process is the empowering of all people, of all individuals. That doesn't mean foolishly dispensing with hierarchy altogether and command structure where needed. It's needed in the military and hospitals and school systems. It is absolutely needed. But is it being used ultimately for the service of people or for their disservice and the service for those atop these pyramid schemes? In this burgeoning age, this very, very new age compared to the history of various civilizations, we are looking to empower the individual. We are looking for the leveling of toxic structures that are that are founded upon exploitation and dehumanization. We are looking to recognize and exalt the human spirit, irrespective of the conditioning of the body, of the demographic in which it dwells. Oh, look. Wow, women are people. Wow, cool. Oh, look. Wow, colored people are people. Cool. Children are people. Wow, gay people are people. Wow, trans people are people. Who knew? Look at this. <laughs> the grand revelation, the grand reveal <laughs> that we're all working towards is the recognition of the dignity and the sovereignty of all people. For this to happen, we need to break free of the shackles which bind and disempower people. We need to transcend marginalization and othering. And these issues are not new. In this ancient Indic Sanskrit text, glorifying the principle of power, the Holy Mother, the great goddess, we have profound insight into what is happening on the earth plane to this day with respect to the wielding of power. So once upon a time, the shape-shifting buffalo demon usurped the throne of Indra, Indra, king of gods, and cast out hosts of gods to wander the earth as mere mortals. You know, there is this archetype in the human condition which loves power in the sense of wielding power over others, in the sense of coveting the position of others. This is very different from an innate power where one has the colossal power to sing or to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is, uh, I want to sort of exert my force over other people, other entities, steal other people's positions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so insightfully, this archetype in the human condition is a shapeshifter. It's a pretender. It tells you what you want to hear to get what it wants. One minute it's this, one minute it's that. There is currently a glaring example of this on the global stage that has possessed millions of people. Okay. In this ancient Indic text, we have this, this uh, uh, brilliant mythologization of this process where a shape-shifting buffalo demon usurps the throne. And this isn't a situation where they can like, oh, we'll just uh, wait four years and vote him out. No, this individual will be on the throne in perpetuity if something is not done. So Indra and the gods were cast out of heaven, wandering the earth as mere mortals. They were robbed of their rightful status and their, their, their share of the sacrifices, their riches, etc., etc. Displaced and demoralized, roaming the earth and wandering 
wandering and wondering what to do. Indra, wielder of the Vajra, the great thunderbolt, let his entourage depose gods, you know, to the great god Vishnu. So it's interesting. We have this, this strata of Indic uh, myth or thought. How do you want to think of this? That comes from Vedic times. That is the Indic corollary of Indo-European myth, where we have a thunder-wielding king of heaven, sound familiar, i.e. Zeus, uh, Thor, you know, and uh, a band of deities. Uh, and then we've got these great gods of Hinduism. In Puranic Hinduism, we have Brahma, the creator god, Vishnu, the sustainer god, who incarnates, you gay, you gay, <laughs> age after age, for the protection of Dharma, of righteousness. And we have Shiva, the destroyer god, who is much, much more than that glorious Shiva who lodged the poison in his throat when at the churning of the ocean emerged from the churning. Shiva, consort of poverty father of Ganesha, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have sort of this band of Vedic gods, and then you take the elevator up, and then we've got maybe the penthouse, and you've got these three executives, uh, cosmogonic executives, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. And then, according to this text, you can even go higher up, and that is the abode of primordial power, she who is the womb of creation. So, led by their fearless leader, Indra, the gods um, went to the abode of Vishnu to ask his advice. He wasn't so sure, so they all hopped into you know, their minivan, <laughs> and they, they went to, to the abode, uh, the cul-de-sac of Brahma, the creator, four-headed grandfather time, typically ensconced in meditations and deliberations, and Every once in a while, he enjoys, you know, some Netflix series on, on you know, creation myths and whatnot. And, but they all come to him, and he's like, well, I, I don't know what to do. So all the gods of heaven, plus Vishnu, plus Brahma, they all venture out to the abode of Shiva in the Himalayan peaks to report the situation and ask, for aid. Upon hearing the predicament of the gods, Shiva was outraged that Mahisha, the buffalo demon's name is Mahisha, that Mahisha would dare usurp the throne of heaven. He scowled in indignation at the shape-shifting demon's audacity, his face contorted with rage. From his deeply furrowed brow, a beam of fiery light energy, Tejas, emerged. And Vishnu too became outraged. Indeed, how dare Mahisha usurp the throne of heaven? And from his face too emerged a beam of fiery light, Tejas. And Brahma too became outraged at the audacity of this buffalo-headed demon. And from his face too emerged a beam of fiery light, Tejas. Shafts of light were emitted from all the gods, from the outrage of Indra, etc., etc. And all of the light being emitted coalesced, converged as one, and grew in size, the size of a mountain, blazing with fiery and furious incandescence. The cosmic beams pervaded the heavens and were emitted in all directions. The light caused it coalesced into a majestic, glorious being. The gods witnessed the formation of the radiant feminine form before their very eyes. It was Durga, the great goddess, mother of existence. The energy emitted from each of the gods formed a different part of the great goddess. From Vishnu's light, her face was formed. Yama, Yama, the god of death, from his light, from his energy, from his tejas, was formed her hair. From Vishnu's light, her arms were formed. The moon god's light, his radiant soft, formed her very breasts. And from Indra's light, her waist was forged. 
The fire god's light became her eyes, her eyebrows formed from dawn and dusk. The wind became her ears. And so the light of the gods of heaven converged to manifest the goddess, mother of the universe. The gods rejoiced at the appearance of the divine mother, knowing she would, as all mothers do, fulfill their wishes. And in this case, that meant she would restore their stolen power. Have you ever had your power stolen? Have you ever been told you're not good enough? You don't belong? Have you ever experienced shame? Have you been shamed consciously, overtly, covertly, just by the just by the white noise of culture, society? Shame is where you've had your power stolen. You've been told you're lesser than. It is not true, but it is a reality nonetheless, which needs to be worked through. So many, many individuals from various walks of life, various demographic contexts, various ages, so many individuals I have the, the real joy of working with one-on-one -on -one, have this very demon to slay, the demon of having their power stolen in this mythic context personified by Mahisha, the shape-shifting buffalo demon. Now, another crucial aspect of this narrative is that one might fallaciously think the gods create the goddess, and there are even scholars who, who assert this. Um, they haven't spent enough time in the story world. Uh, one has to understand that this is the second myth of the Devi Mahamya. In the first myth, Brahma, the creator, at creation, encounters two demons who are about to destroy all things before they're even created. And he calls to the Holy Mother, who is there. Before the creator has created, she is there. So it is understood that she's part and parcel of the fabric of creation. And in this myth, they do not call her forth, but in a sense, as a magnifying glass concentrates the, the, the rays of the sun to a point where it might even burn through a rope. It's, 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 an, it's, it's, it's becoming more powerful, more amplified, more focused through this process. So too, each of the gods come together to manifest a force that was already part of them. In times when you've had your power stolen, it is important to reclaim your power. And in order to do so, we need to draw on that force, which is part of us. We are all more than we think we are. We are all capable of much, much more than we think we can than we think we are. And what this entails is encountering an obstacle, a limitation, a situation where uh, we need to up our game. We need to dig deep. We need to find a way else perish. And these situations are potent tools of teaching us that we have so much more to us than we've ever realized because we've never had occasion to tap that more. Okay. Your being has a false bottom, as it were. There's more. There's more. There are jewels and gems deep down. So the gods manifest the more, which is the goddess. And they rejoice because they know she will fulfill their wishes and restore their power. The gods, you know, each of them, they have a weapon in this rich symbology associated with all their weapons. Interestingly here, they clone their weapons to present to the great goddess. Shiva bestowed her a trident, cloned from his own. Vishnu, a discus and conch. Agni, the god of fire, presented her a spear. Vayu, the wind god, a bow and an inexhaustible quiver of arrows. Vishwakarman, the divine craftsman, gave her an axe and impenetrable armor. Yama, god of death, presented her a staff. Kala, 
the god of time, a sword and shining shield. Varuna, the god of waters, presented her a noose, and the creator god Brahma gave her beads, a rosary, a mala. She even received a thunderbolt, cloned from Indra's own god of storms. Surya, the sun god, poured his radiance into her pores. And the celestial oceans produced pearls, wondrous garments, earrings, bracelets, anklets, and all manner of radiant ornaments to adorn the Holy Mother, including a magnificent lotus to grace one of her many hands. The Himalayas, the mountains, gave the goddess a majestic lion mount to ride. We've talked before at various narrative vignettes about the import of Vahanas of vehicles. Kartikeya's vehicle, the peacock, represents pride and swiftness. Ganesha's mouse, well, we talked about that. It's a little bit inverted there. But there's always symbolic import pertaining to the Vahana, the vehicle. And lion. What is a lion? Lion's king of the jungle. Sovereignty. Lion does not give his power to anyone. He's not concerned. His pulses and quicken as, quicken as that of the squirrel or the rabbit or the gazelle ever ready to, to ever ready to escape danger. He has a nice, slow pulse, perhaps except when he is engaged in the hunt or endangered somehow, but generally speaking, nice, slow pulse, content, contained, cognizant of his power. So this is her mount. So it was that the Cosmic Mother was manifested by the outrage. I use that as a pun, really. The rage that came out of them was their outrage. We know a thing or two by collective outrage and its power in our times, do we not? And so it was she was manifested by the outrage of the gods and honored and adorned in their hour of need. The glorious goddess accepted their offerings and rode into battle, her defiant laughter resounding throughout the worlds. Gods exclaim, Jaya Jaya, victory to you. And she set out to reconquer heaven's throne. She manifested hordes of her own to engage Mahisha's evil forces. Her roar filled the heavens and the earth shook as the great battle began. Swords, missiles, and arrows flew in all directions as their armies clashed upon the battlefield. Though Mahisha's hordes engaged them with javelins and swords and nooses and axes and all manner of weapons, the goddess's forces prevailed, and the demonic forces were overcome. Then Mahisha, the great buffalo demon himself, rode into battle to engage the goddess. The earth quaked under his great hooves as he flung mountains aside with his fearsome horns, and mighty bellows filled the air and his tail lashed the oceans into a frenzy. His power was great and terrible, and the ousted gods were stricken with fear as they looked on in horror. He made a mad dash at the goddess. In rage, she bound him with her noose, but he turned himself into a lion and escaped. You know, these shape-shifting types, they're really hard to pin down. Hmm? She then decapitated the lion, but not soon enough for him to emerge in his human form, sword in hand, as the goddess pummeled him with arrows, he shapeshifted again to his elephant form. The goddess ran him through with her sword. He shifted again to his buffalo form. So hard to pin down. But <laughs> with great power and great discernment, one can prevail in pinning down such people. The goddess, though mad and raged with anger, was not discouraged. She drank a celestial brew, her eyes reddening, and she laughed again and again. The demon met the din with bellows of his own, inebriated with the divine brew, the goddess explained, Go ahead and bellow, fool. Your brain will be replaced by the cheering of the gods as I slay you where you stand. With these words, she leapt upon the shape-shifting buffalo overlord, pinned him down beneath her feet and beheaded him with her sword once and for all. This is probably the most popular iconographic iteration of the great goddess of Durga, where she's slaying the buffalo demon. And it's been celebrated for centuries and centuries. We see so many iterations historically, all gorgeous, glorious, all 
mm, encapsulating the triumph and the poise of the great goddess. The gods rejoiced at the triumph of the goddess who had accomplished this great task that no one else could. Every one of them praised her majesty and might from the depths of their being, bowing deeply in heartfelt reverence. Pleased by their praise, she offered the gods a boon of their choosing. So they, they praise her gloriously. And she's like, well, thank you. That's so lovely. What can I get you? And they're like, wait, wait, what do you mean? What can I get you? You got us what we wanted. <laughs> this wasn't a please him. This was a thank you him. But they weren't so foolish as to pass up a boon from the Holy Mother. So what did they say? They said, well, you know, what goes up must come down. What goes down must come up. We know too well the ups and downs of property of this material creation. And so certainly there will come a time when we will need you again. Please return in our hour of need. This is our boon. And she said, no problem. All you have to do is remember me. Through the act of remembrance, the power of recalling to mind what is necessary in that moment. Yes? Remember me. Call upon me in your hour of need. And <laughs> I will return at that time. What a, what a beautiful and potent teaching surrounding the power of memory to access knowledge and wisdom that's needed in one's hour of need. Okay. Granting their boon, the goddess vanished, having restored the power of the gods. This um, tale holds tremendous wisdom about the principle of power and its purpose about power which disempowers which versus power which empowers. About disempowerment pertaining to having one's power stolen. And empowerment pertaining to having one's power restored. The first sort of power is extrinsic. People pursue positions and ways of being which pursue power outside of themselves. And most of why this is, is because within them is a big gaping hole. And that big gaping hole is born of ignorance, of the obfuscation of the light of the soul. The light of the soul is innately powerful. There is tremendous power within you. And when you tap that power, you don't need to steal the power of others. Just the opposite. You want nothing more than to share your light with them. You don't need to blow other people's candles out so that yours can shine more brightly. You kindle your flame so that they can brighten their own. And this is how the world becomes a brighter place. These two processes work in opposition of the other intrinsic versus extrinsic power seeking and certainly there is a time and a place to wield power in the outer world there's a time and a place for armies and and um, hierarchies etc 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 but ultimately the spiritual journey and even a material journey well lived of a filling life in the world is predicated upon owning one's power, reclaiming the power that has been stolen by others, by um, individuals, by families, by clans, by society in general. Right? And then once one has healed from this process of having one's power stolen, once one reclaims one's power, 
Ultimately, the purpose of power is to empower others. Well, I hope that this meditation on power through its personification through the great goddess has been of use in some way. I hope indeed that these inspired insights are pertinent to the path you walk in this life. If I can be of service in any way, by all means, reach out. Get in touch for requests for further episodes. Um, what else? Come study with me at the Indian Wisdom School. There's no shortage of goddess courses there. It's a great passion of mine, actually. All things Shakti. Um, perhaps even come study with me in person at one of my international retreats. Either way, keep well until the next episode and keep contemplating the purpose of power in its manifestations in your life. Namaste.